to uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So we hear beginning with verse 14 through 17. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. But thank God, who is always leading us around through Christ as if we were in a parade. He releases the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere through us. We smell like the aroma of Christ's offering to God, both to those who are being saved and to those who are on the road to destruction. We smell like a contagious dead person to those who are dying, but we smell like the fountain of life to those who are being saved. Who's qualified for this kind of ministry? We aren't like so many people who hustle the Word of God to make a profit. We are speaking through Christ in the presence of God as those who are sincere and those who are sent from God. Friends, this is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us pray. Well, God, we never want to take for granted the privilege we have, not only as your followers, but people living in this country, to freely read your word and to worship together. So we give you thanks for your word and its truth in our lives. And we ask this morning, oh God, show us something different through the reading of your word. Let us see you just a little more clearly today because of your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think it was around the time of middle school uh, that I realized my peers' opinion of me started to ratchet up on my priority list. Up until that point, I didn't really care. <laughs> but in middle school, it mattered to me what people thought of me. I was somebody who wanted to be liked. I wanted to be important. I wanted to be popular. And I wanted people uh, to know me for the right reasons, to see me as somebody who was upright and did the right thing. Of course, as many of you know, uh, often that requires keeping up with the Joneses. And keeping up with the Joneses is not always easy. Of course, financially, my family always had all the things we needed. We even had more. But as I looked around at my friends and what they had and the things they did and the activities that they were involved in, I realized that I didn't have all the cutting-edge things that they did. So keeping up with them was rather difficult, I mean, impossible. One Christmas, however, one Christmas, that changed for me. You see, at that Christmas, my stepdad ended up giving my brother and I Tommy Hilfiger cologne. Anybody know Tommy Hilfiger? Okay. I think they still make it, but i got to tell you, when I was in middle school, that was, I don't know how to say it, other than that was the jam. That was the best stuff ever. Okay, so all of the popular guys in school wore it. Um, it was, or at least it seemed to me, to be pretty pricey. Um, and if you wanted to put one exclamation point at the end of why people should be around you, mm, Tommy was your <laughs> stuff. Tommy Hilfiger was awesome. And now we had it in my family, okay? So this is a big deal. Well, we kind of had it. So here's the story. My stepdad ended up getting a holiday gift basket filled with cologne items. You probably know where this is going. How many of y'all have seen those items before? Right? You'll have... The cologne and the lotion and the shampoo and the body spray and the, well, not body spray but um, shower lotion and all that, uh, soap and all that stuff. So we had he ended up getting a, a basket of that stuff and there was one cologne in there. So I don't know how it happened between my brother and I. I guess we drew straws. My brother got the actual cologne. I ended up getting the lotion. Okay? <laughs> if you smell it, it still smells like Tommy. So what I did, I can remember getting ready for school before middle school. And I put the lotion, I think I put it on my neck. That wasn't strong enough, so I put it on my shirt. <laughs> I put it all over. That stuff was pretty heavy on. Now, because it wasn't as strong as the actual cologne, I wanted to make sure it was going to last throughout the day. Friends, you got to be able to laugh about yourself, right? So I can, I can look back now and tell you the only, time I, the only time I smelled worse than when I bathed in that stuff in the morning was around fifth period. Because around fifth period, I had just got back from gym class. So when I kept that stuff on, I didn't take into account what sweat and physical activity would do to an already smelly lotion. So instead of fitting in, I'm here to tell you, I smelled like a wet dog. Who wore Tommy Hilfiger pillow? So. 
Oh man, it was amazing. So take a lesson to me. Smells are not always uh, what they seem in the morning. So we continued uh, this week in our five-week sermon series we're calling Making Sense of the Gospel. Uh, in this sermon series, we're simply looking at the ways in which we can engage with the world through our five senses. It's a chance for us to explore some tangible ways in which we can see God around us. Many of us experience it all the time. There's, it's not really fancy. There's no prerequisites to it. It's simply an opportunity for us to engage with the things that God has already given us. So we began last week with taste. We talked about how taste reminds us that God is constantly providing for us and that God is constantly present with us. And today we continue with our sense of smell. Now smell, I think, is a really important, I mean, all the senses are important, but this is one that really sticks out to me because I think smell does something uh, that few of the senses do and that it clues us in to what's going on around us, even before we fully experienced it. Before we enter into a room, smell gives us an idea of what's going on, right? Maybe you've been uh, approaching someplace and it's something pleasant. Maybe yeast rolls baking in the oven, right? I heard some mm, people get close to lunch. Okay? Maybe it was a very small amount, a very tactful amount of pine tree perfume in a well-cleaned car, right? Those are, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe it's still not pleasant, but for me it is. So, <laughs> So for most of us, those are pleasant experiences, right? Our sense of smell allows us to lean into those things. Tell us those are things we want to be around. If you've ever been walking around something that's not as pleasant, maybe it's unpleasant. How about the pungent smell that may be coming from the refrigerator? Or maybe a smell of smoke billowing out of a room. Or too much cologne on a middle schooler. In those moments, our minds tell us we don't need to go any bit closer. Right? We've seen enough. We need to stay far away. The first time our, our smell hits our olfactory sensors, the sensors that uh, deal with the, the sense of smell, we identify what the source of that smell is. And we decide really quickly, many of you may not be aware of uh, it happening, we're deciding, do I want to be around it? Do I want to be involved with the source of this smell? Or do I want to stay away? It's a protection mechanism. It's a really cool thing, the way that we're wired. Then aside from my embarrassing story about cologne, the topic of smell regularly brings to my mind images of home and family. I can remember routinely going home uh, and getting hit as soon as I went in the kitchen with the smell of chocolate chip cookies that my mom had baked, and they're sitting out on the counter to rest and cool. The warmth of the cookies in the oven would still uh, warm up the, the kitchen on a seemingly cold winter day. Or my mom would bake yellow cakes for her business and the, the smell of yellow cake. I like chocolate too, but specifically yellow when it would waft through the house when she was getting ready to make one for her job. Or I think of my favorite food growing up. I apologize for this many food references this close to lunch. My favorite food growing up was corn potato chowder. And each time I smelled it, I seemed to go through a certain, uh, a certain process when I would experience it. I noticed the sauteed onions and celery cutting through the smell of brown sausage. Then the, the, the scent of the soup base of milk and butter and corn would kick in, kind of sweeten things up. And then at the very end was the, the potato, which you could just barely smell, but it added a certain richness to it. Friends, i got to tell you, I haven't smelled that stuff in probably 15 years. And every time I think about it, and, and this morning at Evanston and here, I'm remembering what it tasted like, because I can remember how it smelled. It took me right back. I'm sure I'm not the only one who, has, uh, who immediately connects smell with food. How many of y'all have a favorite dish that you enjoy? How many of y'all have a favorite dish you enjoy that means a whole lot to you really, not because of how it tastes, not because of what the food was, but because of what was going on around you? That smell can remind us of, of important things in our lives. See, it's fitting, I think, that we follow up last week's talk on taste with this week's talk on smell, because really, taste and smell work together a lot. If you don't believe me, try eating something and plugging your nose. It tastes completely different. Smell is involved in all of that stuff. For many of us, I think smell is our strongest and most pronounced of the senses. I mean, it's the one that I constantly rely on most. It's maybe the most trustworthy. Smell can strongly influence our experience of something, and I think smell can even enhance our experience. 
Take, for example, the, the smell that's in the air right now. What, what do y'all smell now? <coughs> Hopefully you smell it. Coffee. coffee, there we go. I heard somebody ask who spilled the coffee this morning. There was no coffee spill. Uh, there, there, there should be coffee smell in the air. From an early age, I can remember being enthralled by coffee. And I can tell you, I didn't start drinking coffee until a few years ago. But from an early age, I can remember just loving the smell of it. The deep, rich notes of the beans, strong and almost alarming how bold they were. And then immediately they're followed up uh, by something sweeter, maybe the French vanilla flavor or the hazelnut or something like that. And I love the smell of coffee. Now, even to this day, I don't really enjoy shopping a whole lot. I think I've shared that with you all before. It gets kind of overwhelming for me. I want to get in, get out. I don't like to spend a whole lot of time doing it. But I could spend hours, even now as an adult, I could spend hours sitting in the coffee aisle. Right? No, 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 I'm talking about with all of the bags of coffee, the grinders there. I mean, all of the smells are mixing together. Coffees that probably aren't supposed to go together. For me, they smell incredible. And I could sit for hours smelling that. You see, for me, when I smell coffee, it boosts my mood. It immediately, even before I come into the room, it makes me think of being alert and being productive. When I try to get up early in the morning, I have coffee going, if not for motivation. Now, the caffeine is great. It works. It, it does its job. But for me, it's the smell of coffee that makes it so potent. I mean, I eventually, even because of the smell, grew to love the flavor of coffee. I gotta tell you, if it wasn't for the smell, I would stop drinking it right now. Because the smell of coffee is what gives its power to me anyways. That's why I enjoy it. Dr. Maggie Grotzinger writes that the olfactory nerves, the nerves that deal with our smell, go to two places. Now the first one is what you might expect. The first is to the frontal cortex where our mind recognizes what a scent is it identifies where the scent's coming from. It does some of the basic X's and O's questions of what the scent is. But the second place uh, that our olfactory nerves go to is was a little surprising to me, and that's the limbic area. That area focuses on uh, more on emotion and on motivation and on certain types of memory. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really control a whole lot of my emotions or my motivation or certain memories. In fact, that's usually subconscious. Things that happen. So subconsciously, smell is connecting with memory and with experience. It doesn't only help us to identify the things that are going on and experiences we're having, but smell can also help us to qualify those things. Is it a good smell? Is it a bad smell? Is it a, an indifferent smell? Is it, you know, does it promote danger? What, what is going on with this smell? For many of us, the sharp smell of Lysol disinfectant spray calls to mind a sterile environment, maybe of hospitals or nurseries or other sanitized places. Maybe on the other hand, uh, the smell of a newborn baby. How many of y'all have ever smelled the head of a newborn baby? Pretty good, so I don't feel as weird saying that. All right. That smell uh, can draw us all into the role of a protector and a defender of life. There's another newborn baby smell as well that maybe is not as pleasant as pleasant. <laughs> At Evanston last time, I said another newborn baby smell, and someone said, "Yeah, I saw." <laughs> but that other smell reminds us something needs to be changed. Something isn't right. These smells do a whole lot in telling us what we need to do, how we need to respond. See, smells remain often triggering long lost memories. If you think of the scent of a loved one. Maybe that lingers in your home on a, a particular item of clothing that you have. Smells of beloved dishes, and it reminds you of all the great conversations you had around that meal table. The aroma of particular aspects of nature. If your allergies are up to it, this is a great time to experience those. All of these can trigger the onset of nostalgia even decades after we experience those things in our lives. See, to me, this is undoubtedly the strongest of my senses. I mean, it's just, it's, I think it's so important. You know, we see it in worship as well. For many of us, this worship space has its own unique smell. How many of y'all have ever thought about the smell that the, the sanctuary has? Not just today when it smells like coffee, but in general. If you think about it, this place has its own unique smell. 
The combination of, of wooden pews and, and carpet and old hymnals all converge together to make a smell of this place. When we come in here, we know, we can have our eyes closed and know that we are in worship. The specific smells of pine needles and poinsettias and Easter lilies highlight the specific seasons of the church year that we experience here in worship. Smell is a huge part to play in that. In fact, smell heightens our experience of church and of worship. But you know, that's not just unique to our congregation. We see it even in the Bible. We see the incorporation of smells with a connection to God and to people. In the temple, for example, as you all know, yearly people would make their trek up to the temple. And while they were in the temple, they would offer their burnt animal sacrifices to God. It was a way for them to atone for their sin, to apologize to God, basically, and, and promise to do better in life and to worship God. But you know, when they were offering animal sacrifices, we kind of get the sanitized version here. It wasn't done in a vacuum. I mean, if you think about walking into uh, the temple, you would get the smells of these sacrifices going on. As the smoke would rise, it was said that that would emulate uh, for people the fact that their prayers were rising to God as well. So when you see the smoke rise, you know that your prayers rise to God when he hears them. In John's Revelation, chapter 8, he, he writes this of, of this image. Another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is, altar that is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Many of us have come from church traditions with incense or other sensory components. How many of y'all know what incense smells like? You've seen it before, okay? I often think of, of a Catholic church. If I've ever been blessed to sit through a Catholic mass, I get an image of a priest walking in. And of course, if you see the priest come in, usually the priest isn't alone. Uh, the priest also has uh, the acolyte carrying the light uh, to light the candles, and somebody carrying the word of God, and somebody would carry the cross. But usually the priest is carrying what looks almost like a swinging lantern, except there's no light coming from it. And he would swing it as he's walking through it. If you pay enough attention, um, you'll see smoke is coming out of it, because that's called a censer, and it has incense in it. And boy, that stuff is powerful. And as he's coming, you're supposed to see not only that this is a pleasing smell, and ours is a, a, a God who smells good, and, and everything about God is good, but the smoke rises, and our prayer and devotion rises to God. It gives us a visual of what our devotion might look like billowing out of the room, just like the smoke billows out of the censer. These things are not accidental, just like the coffee smell this morning was not accidental. Smell plays a very clear role in our worship of God. Because you see, any sort of sweet smell, whether it's incense or coffee or other things, all of these things are meant to point us back in our mind to the sweetness of God. Ours is a good God. Amen? Amen. Amen? We believe we serve a good God who is faithful when all else fails. We serve a God who is present when everyone else deserts. And so when we come to worship, we do it first and foremost to celebrate God's goodness. And you know, smell has a huge part to play in that. Smell kind of primes the pump for that worship of God in the beginning. But of course, it doesn't stop in the sanctuary. As you leave here, any good and pleasant smell in our world is also meant to point us back uh, to an acknowledgement of God's faithfulness in our lives. The strong scent of coffee, for example, maybe should remind us of the life and the energy and the vigor of God present around us. The sweet aroma of a flower might remind us of God's beautiful acts of creation. The constant smell of good food should point us to the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in our world. The sweetness we smell around us ought to immediately connect us back to the sweetness of God. But you know, it doesn't stop there. We can acknowledge God's goodness, but our scripture this morning goes a little bit beyond. The, the sense of smell triggers something much more vigorous than just an identification of goodness around us. Paul writes, But thank God who is always leading us around through Christ as if we were in a parade. He releases the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere through us. We smell like the aroma of Christ's offering to God. 
both to those who are being saved and to those who are on the road to destruction. See, Paul points out in this letter, as do a lot of theologians throughout history, that everything good begins with God. And we can identify that. Nothing good happens without first originating in God. And this wonderful fragrance, which I would have loved to have known what it smells like, begins in God, and we see it in Jesus Christ. But you know, in verse 14, it doesn't stop there. Paul says, then, God releases the fragrance of the knowledge of Him, God, everywhere through us. God releases the fragrance of the knowledge of God through us. God's sweet aroma was on display through Jesus, and now it's passed on to us. We have work to do, friends. To be like that same sweet aroma. In the Interpreter's Bible Commentary, the writer says, Through us, God spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. The surrendered life has a quality which is like the perfume that permeates the air from a flower that is crushed. It calls to mind for me those temple images, the images of, of sacrifices and incense of our worship rising to God. Our sense of smell should make us wonder, how does our worship smell to God? Just that the incense is a pleasing aroma and the animal sacrifices were a pleasing aroma to God. What's the quality of my worship to God in my life? Is it a sweet fragrance like incense? Is it a sterile fragrance, maybe like disinfectant? Or is it a stench that won't relent? See, God has given us incredible gifts via this sense of smell. Smell allows us to experience the world in incredible ways. It gives us a foretaste of what we're entering into before we even get there. But this scripture is calling each of us to reflect on the type of fragrance that we offer to the world. And no matter how foul we may have been, God knows I've been there. Each passing moment offers us a new opportunity to reconnect again with that sweet aroma of God and what kind of fragrance I'm called to leave in the world. So as you smell the aromas present among us, may they call you back to a greater appreciation of this life that God has given us. May you pause to reflect on God's goodness and the ways that God's grace goes before you. And may you live in a way that leads you to smell like the aroma of Christ's offering. That even before others see you coming, they might experience God's love in and through you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.